Think Shark Tank is all success stories? Think again. We're exposing the dirty truth of the seven biggest Shark Tank failures ever. From toy companies that tanked to fitness fads that fizzled out, we're peeling back the curtain on ambition gone awry and revealing the gritty reality behind these jaw-dropping failures. First up, the case of Toy Guru, the Netflix of toys that once promised to revolutionize playtime, but ultimately ended up collecting dust in the Shark Tank graveyard. Remember season two, episode two? Nikki Pope strutted in, confident as a peacock pitching her brainchild, a subscription service where parents could rent toys for their kids instead of buying mountains of plastic that inevitably ended up forgotten in corners. It was like Netflix, but for Legos and Barbies. The Sharks loved the concept. Finally, someone was tackling the toy clutter issue. Nikki even secured a sweet deal, $200,000 for 35% of the company. Things were looking up. Toy Guru had the hype, the investment, and a problem it seemed every parent with a toddler understood. So, what went wrong? Problem number one, the logistics labyrinth. Turns out, renting toys ain't as simple as sending out Netflix DVDs. Imagine the chaos of shipping bulky, breakable objects, keeping them clean and sanitary between use, and then efficiently tracking their return. Toy Guru underestimated the logistical nightmare they'd created. Costs ballooned, and with those cute subscription prices, they were barely breaking even. Problem number two, the toy avalanche. Another hurdle? Sourcing those toys. Imagine trying to negotiate deals with major toy manufacturers for limited time rentals. Not exactly a recipe for success. Toy Guru ended up with a mishmash of inventory, often lacking the hottest names kids craved. The Netflix magic of endless choice just wasn't there. Problem number three, the Shark Tank effect. Remember that initial hype? Turns out, Shark Tank exposure can be a catch-22. The sudden surge in demand overwhelmed Toy Guru's already fragile infrastructure, shipping delays, customer service breakdowns, and toy shortages. The complaints started piling up faster than discarded building blocks. The fallout. Toy Guru struggled to keep afloat. Nikki and her team fought valiantly, but the weight of logistical woes, financial constraints, and a tarnished reputation proved too much. In 2014, Toy Guru sadly closed its doors, leaving parents with fond memories of the dream and a cautionary tale about the challenges of disrupting the toy industry. But wait, there's a Shark Tank-worthy twist. Toy Guru's demise paved the way for other rental services like Kidbox and Playful, who learned from their predecessors' mistakes and refined the model. Today, the toy rental market is thriving, proving that the core idea Nikki had wasn't a dud, just ahead of its time. So, what can we take away from the Toy Guru saga? It's a reminder that even the most promising ideas can stumble, sometimes spectacularly. Failure number two, the breathometer. Remember that season five episode where Charles Michael Yim walked in, claiming to have the world's first smartphone breathalyzer? Yeah, about that. This tech-savvy entrepreneur had the sharks mesmerized. Imagine blowing into your phone and knowing your exact blood alcohol content instantly. No more awkward trips to the police station. No more fuzzy math calculating how many tequila shots is too many. It was a safety revolution in your pocket, and the Sharks threw down a cool million for 30% of the company. But here's where the fairy tale goes south, faster than a spilled Long Island iced tea. Turns out, blowing into your phone isn't quite the same as a professional breathalyzer. The breathometer readings were, shall we say, imprecise. Problem number one, blowing in the wind. The science was just wonky. Breathometers relied on analyzing your breath sample, but external factors like temperature and even the type of phone you use could throw the readings off like a sailor in a hurricane. So, 
Your fancy new gadget might tell you you're sober as a judge when you're actually on your way to becoming a courtroom exhibit. Problem number two, law and disorder. Remember, accuracy in a blood alcohol content device isn't just a nice to have, it's a legal requirement. And guess what? The breathometer didn't meet those requirements. This led to a major lawsuit from the Federal Trade Commission, forcing the company to pull the product from the market and issue refunds. The aftermath. It wasn't a pretty picture. The Sharks lost their million. Yim's reputation took a beating, and the trust of countless consumers went up in smoke, pun intended. Breathometer became a cautionary tale in the tech world, a reminder that innovation without validation can lead to a one-way trip to Shark Tank purgatory. But the story doesn't end there. Yim learned from his mistakes and pivoted the company, focusing on other health-related tech. Today, Breathometer offers products like Mint, which analyzes breath to give insights into oral health. So, while the smartphone breathalyzer dream fizzled out, Yim proved that sometimes even a Shark Tank shipwreck can lead to new shores. So, what's the takeaway? Well, for entrepreneurs, it's a call for rigorous testing and scientific backing before promising the moon. And for us consumers, it's a reminder to be skeptical of anything that claims to measure our lives from a phone screen. Because sometimes, the only thing blowing in the wind is the hype. Blunder number three, the sticky saga of sweet balls. Remember season five when James McDonald and Cole Egger stepped into the tank with their gourmet cake balls, promising to revolutionize convenience store snacks? Let's talk about that. These guys had the sharks hooked Picture bite-sized bliss, perfectly portioned cake balls in trendy flavors like red velvet and peanut butter chocolate chip, wrapped in sleek packaging and ready to grab and go. It was like cupcakes meets protein bar, and the sharks bit hard, investing $250,000 for 25% of the company. A really sweet deal. But here's where the frosting starts to drip. Turns out, Running a cake ball empire isn't all sprinkles and rainbows. James and Cole soon face some major challenges. Problem number one, the distribution dilemma. Convenience stores, their target market, weren't exactly lining up to stock gourmet treats with a short shelf life. They faced logistical nightmares, from keeping the delicate balls fresh to convincing store owners to take a chance on a new player. Problem number two, the costly craze, gourmet ingredients and fancy packaging, don't come cheap. Sweet balls struggle to balance quality with pricing, leading to higher costs than your average candy bar. This made it even tougher to convince budget-conscious convenience store customers to shell out for a single serving indulgence. Problem number three, the founder friction. And then there was the drama behind the scenes. James and Cole, who started as partners, began to disagree on major decisions. This internal conflict hampered their ability to work cohesively and navigate the already turbulent business landscape. The bitter outcome, the combination of logistical hurdles, financial strains, and a fractured partnership proved too much for Sweet Balls. In 2015, after a lengthy lawsuit in which James accused Cole of attempting to start a competing business, James bought out Cole and continued running the company as a side hustle, but it's no longer the full-time operation it once was. Despite the setback, Sweet Balls paved the way for other gourmet snack brands. They showed that there's a market for premium treats on the go, even if convenience stores weren't the ideal partners. Today, you'll find similar concepts thriving in grocery stores and online markets. Failure number four, the rise and fall of Body Jack, the fitness gadget that promised to make those dreaded chest presses a breeze. Remember season one, when inventor Larry Jones skipped into the shark's den with his invention, claiming it could magically amplify your push-up power? Well, Larry had the shark sweating with excitement. Body Jack was a contraption that attached to your back 
and supposedly increased your push-up power by up to 30%. No more struggling, no more excuses, just instant rippedness. The Sharks, blinded by the promise of ripped abs and bulging biceps, threw down $250,000 for 20% of the company. Body Jack was poised to become the next big thing in fitness. But here's where the gains turned into strains. Turns out, Body Jack wasn't quite the scientific marvel it was hyped up to be. Problem number one, the physics fizzle. The basic premise of Body Jack was flawed. Its straps and pulleys supposedly shifted your center of gravity, making push-ups easier. But biomechanics experts had a different story. They called it a gimmick, arguing that it simply changed the muscle groups used, not actually making push-ups easier or more effective. Problem number two, the injury inferno. Those supposed gains quickly turned into pains for some users. Reports of muscle strain and even shoulder injuries started surfacing. This wasn't exactly the sculpted bod Body Jack promised, and lawsuits soon followed, casting a shadow over the company's once glowing reputation. Problem number three, the hype hangover. Remember all that initial excitement? Yeah, it faded faster than a New Year's resolution. Consumers realized Body Jack wasn't the magic push-up potion they were sold, and sales plummeted. The Sharks, realizing they'd invested in a fitness flop, cut their losses and swam away. The fallout. Body Jack eventually faded into fitness infamy, a cautionary tale about the dangers of overhyped gadgets and the importance of scientific backing in the wellness world. The silver lining? The Body Jack fiasco sparked important conversations about responsible advertising and the need for evidence-based claims in the fitness industry. Today, consumers are more skeptical of fitness fads, and companies are generally held to a higher standard of scientific validity. So, what's the takeaway? For entrepreneurs, it's a reminder that honesty and scientific grounding are crucial for building a sustainable business. And for us consumers, it's a lesson in healthy skepticism. Failure number five, the show no towels. Remember season three, when Michelle and Jennifer sashayed in with their clip-on towel invention, promising to revolutionize beachside fashion and practicality. These ladies had the sharks, hook, line, and sinker. Picture this, no more bulky towels slipping off, sand castles imprinted on your back, or awkward towel-holding contortions. Show no towels with their clever clip-on design were like wearable beach blankets, keeping you dry and stylish simultaneously. The sharks, lured by the vision of sun-kissed profits, took the bait, investing $150,000 for 30% of the company. Show no towels were poised to become the next big thing on the beach. But here's where the tide turned against them. Turns out, paradise wasn't paved with show no towels for a few key reasons. Problem number one, the niche nuisance. While the ladies touted the versatility of their invention, from poolside to yoga, the core market beachgoers wasn't quite convinced. Show no towels were bulky to pack, awkward to wear, and not much faster to dry than a regular towel. The convenience factor just didn't outweigh the strange silhouette and the, is that a towel? Stairs. Wow. Problem number two, the costly coral. Show no towels weren't exactly beach budget friendly. The production cost was high, translating to a hefty price tag for consumers who could simply grab a cheap towel from the dollar store. In the land of flip-flops and free sunshine, Practicality trumped novelty. Problem number three, the shark tank effect. Again, dealing with the sharks, you get a lot of initial hype and unfortunately, that can be a double-edged sword. The sudden surge in attention overwhelmed the small company's production and marketing capacity. Quality control issues arose, orders went unfulfilled, and customer frustration mounted faster than a sandcastle in a storm. The washout. Ultimately, 
show no towels couldn't weather the wave of challenges. In 2013, they sadly ceased operations, leaving behind a lesson in understanding your target market, pricing competitively, and managing post-Shark Tank growth. But there's a glimmer of sunshine. The show no towel story isn't entirely a bust. Their unique design sparked creativity in the beachwear industry, leading to innovations like more stylish and practical wraps and cover-ups. Today, we see a wider range of beachwear options that prioritize both comfort and function. Faux pas number six, KDAP, the controversial privacy tool that promised to erase unwanted calls and messages. Remember season four, when Neil Desai swaggered in with his app, claiming to offer ultimate control over your digital communications. Yeah, about that. Kate App had the sharks intrigued. Imagine silencing those pesky exes, hiding work calls on vacation, or discreetly dodging awkward family drama, all with a few taps on your phone. It seemed like the ultimate weapon for anyone seeking digital invisibility. The sharks, blinded by the potential for success, threw down $70,000 for 35% of the company. Kate App was poised to become the privacy powerhouse of the App Store. But here's where the plot thickened. Turns out, absolute control over your communication can get tangled in ethical knots faster than a dropped phone in the bathtub. Problem number one, the privacy paradox. Kate App's core function intercepting and hiding calls and messages raised serious concerns about transparency and trust. While some applauded the app's potential for combating harassment, others saw it as a gateway to deception and manipulation. The line between privacy and dishonesty became blurry, raising ethical questions that made the sharks uneasy. Problem number two, the legal limbo. Legality quickly became a slippery slope for Kate App. Intercepting and altering personal communications could potentially violate laws, depending on the context and intent. This legal minefield left the app's future uncertain, casting a shadow of doubt over its long-term viability. Problem number three, the backlash bites. As public awareness of Kate App grew, so did the criticism. Social media erupted with concerns about the app's potential for abuse, leading to negative press and a public relations nightmare. The once promising investment began to look like a liability, and the shark started swimming away. The fallout. Ultimately, Kate App couldn't withstand the wave of ethical and legal concerns. Despite its initial hype, the app faded into obscurity leaving behind a cautionary tale about the importance of considering the ethical implications of technology before chasing profits. The one thing that the Kate App saga did accomplish was sparking important conversations about digital privacy, user consent, and the potential misuse of technology. Today, app developers are more aware of the ethical boundaries of their creations, and users are more conscious of the data they share. For users, it's a lesson in questioning the tools we use and being vigilant about who controls our digital communications. Remember, just because you can erase something from your screen doesn't mean it disappears from the bigger picture. And now, for our last epic blunder, this time on the shark's part. Failure number seven. The story of Doorbot, now known as Ring. Remember season six when Jamie Siminoff strode in with his brainchild, a smart doorbell that lets you see and talk to visitors from your phone? Who wouldn't want one of those? Jamie had the sharks drooling. Imagine the power of knowing who's at your door before you open it, whether it's the pizza guy, the pesky salesman, or your long lost Aunt Gertrude. Doorbot promised security, convenience, and a peek into the world outside your doorstep, all from the comfort of your couch. The sharks, enamored with the vision, threw down a million bucks for just 10% of the company. Doorbot was poised to revolutionize home security. But here's where the plot takes a surprising twist. Remember that million dollar deal? It wasn't enough. 
DoorBot faced manufacturing setbacks, logistical hurdles, and the ever-present pressure to compete in a cutthroat market. The Sharks, despite their initial enthusiasm, grew apprehensive. Problem number one, the doubting Sharks. Mark Cuban notoriously called DoorBot too gimmicky, questioning its long-term appeal. Others worried about the competition and the market saturation of security systems. These doubts, though harsh, pushed Jamie to refine his vision and focus on what truly mattered, building a reliable, user-friendly product. Problem number two, the Shark Tank pressure. Under the intense scrutiny and high expectations of the tank, Jamie faced immense pressure to succeed quickly. This led to some early missteps, like focusing on integrations with other smart home systems before solidifying the core functionality. However, these failures became valuable lessons, shaping DoorBot into a more robust and user-centric product. The unexpected turnaround. Despite the Shark Tank skepticism, Jamie persevered. He secured additional funding, honed his product, and pivoted his marketing strategy. DoorBot evolved into Ring, focusing on security and peace of mind for homeowners. And guess what? The gamble paid off. Today, Ring is a billion-dollar company and a leader in the smart home security market. Its video doorbells are ubiquitous, used by millions worldwide. Jamie's resilience, adaptability, and unwavering belief in his vision proved the Sharks wrong. Ring's success is a testament to the power of perseverance and continuous improvement, even in the face of doubt. And for aspiring innovators, it's a reminder that Shark Tank deals aren't the only pathway to success. Sometimes, the greatest lessons come from overcoming skepticism and refining your vision through challenges. Remember, even a door slammed in your face might just lead to a wider, more open path.